Well, good morning again, and this is the midweek, this is Wednesday, and in the middle of the week, we like to look at a different topic, a different theme, and that is discipleship evangelism. Because, you know, Jesus said, that was part, some of his parting words to us, was that we were, were to go and make, make disciples of all nations. And what does it mean to make disciples? Well, a disciple is a student. And so Jesus said, teaching them all that I have commanded you. So a person who becomes or who allows Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior must be taught, must be given the foundational teachings of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so this is a very important lesson. We started uh, this identity in Christ last week. And this lesson, again, you have the PDF file. I have a link in the email to that if you, don't or if you have not already saved it. So you can look at this yourself, but we'll just discuss it, right, in this uh, video and just go over these things and then you can look at it later uh, in the PDF file and, and, you know, solidify some of the things that we have said. But identity in Christ is very important. So this lesson was written by Andrew Womack and... This does come from Karis Bible College. He is the founder and the president of the um, Andrew Womack Ministries, in which he is also the leader of the Karis Bible College as well. But uh, so he's writing about this, and this is one of his central teachings that he harps on quite a bit in his teaching. Because he is a teacher. He's, he is a Bible teacher. And, you know, the Lord just led him into developing and creating a Bible college there. But in our last lesson, Andrew discussed what it meant to be born again. And the fact that being born again takes place in our spirits. In other words, it's our hearts, what we call our hearts are changed, but it's our spirits. So Andrew used Second Corinthians 5.17, which says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So we see that when we're born again, there's a total transformation that takes place where? In our spirits. And Andrew says the only way that we really know that there's been a transformation in our spirits is through the Word of God. Why? Because we can't perceive it through external things. We can't perceive it necessarily through our emotions because that's in the soulish realm. But it's in the spirit part of us. That's where a total transformation takes place. So Andrew uses a few scriptures here which demonstrates or shows what happens or what takes place when we do receive Jesus Christ into our lives. For example, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, Paul writes and says, Put on the new man. So we're to put it on. When this expression, put on, is like putting on clothes to me. You know, you have to dress yourself. So put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, and true holiness. You know, that's one thing about it is that, like it says in Leviticus 19, God says, Be ye holy, for I 
am holy. God is a holy God. And for us to be in relationship with us, we have to be holy. But that doesn't take place until we're born again because we were born with a sin nature because of Adam and because of his disobedience and his sin by not doing what the Lord had asked him to do. So we have been born with that pro propensity to sin. So it's our spirit that has to be born again. And so when a person is born again, it's their spirit. It's our spirit that becomes righteous and truly holy. Now, the Bible actually speaks of two types of holy or righteousness. Now, there's a righteousness that we have of our own, so to speak. It's through our actions and how we interact with other people. You know, if we don't live right and we don't do right, well, he gives a couple of examples here. Your boss may fire you if you don't do right, or your spouse may divorce you if you're not living right and doing right with your spouse. So there is a type of self-righteousness, if you will. Uh, and some people, are they think they're very self-righteous. But again, you know, the, if you ask some people if they're going to heaven, they'll say, well, I'm a good person. What does that mean? Well, I, I do. I live right. I do right. You know, I don't mistreat people. I try to be kind, you know, and all these things. So that's a righteousness of our own. But God doesn't accept us based on our righteousness. God literally, literally, when we are born again, gives us his righteousness. So in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says that God the Father made the Son to become sin for us that we might be made, we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is talking about the righteousness of God, not our righteousness. So there's a righteousness that goes far beyond our righteousness. And it's based on what God did for us. We literally receive the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So the scripture says we were created in righteousness and true holiness. So that doesn't mean that we're growing into that righteousness. It means that we've already been made righteous. So a simple ne definition is that we are already in right standing with God if we're born again. So God is pleased with us, not based on anything else, not based on us, but based on Christ and what Christ has done for us. Now, it's in our spirits where this change takes place. We're already created in righteousness and true holiness and are brand new creations if we're born again. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are in, I'm sorry, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So we were created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In other words, the righteousness flows out from Jesus living inside of us, in our spirits. In our spirits... When we're born again, we are perfect and complete. There's no sin. There's no inadequacy. Ephesians 1.13 says, After you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Well, some people might say, well, 
when I first believed on the Lord, I did believe that I was totally forgiven and cleansed and everything was okay. But since that time, I've sinned. I've failed God again and again and again. Well, if you did, you failed in your actions and in your mental or emotional part, but your spirit did not sin. It was not your spirit being that sinned. The scripture says we were sealed. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And Andrew compares that to a woman who puts fruit into a jar and then puts paraffin over it to make it airtight and to keep all the impurities out. If you don't do that, then there's going to be bacteria. And then you can't eat the fruit in that jar. So he's using that analogy saying that God sealed us. So when we were born again, we received a new spirit. And sin does not penetrate your spirit. You have a new identity. For you have to have, for you to have relationship with God, you have to fellowship with and worship Him based on who you are in your spirit, not in your flesh. Now, this is really the great transformation in our lives that a person has to change their identity. In other words, you have to relate to God based not on what you do in the physical realm, not what you think in your mind, but who you are in the Spirit based on what He has done for you. That it's a completed work, something that doesn't fluctuate. It doesn't flip-flop back and forth. You were created in righteousness and true holiness. Now this is the spirit part of us. And to fellowship with God, we have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We have to stand in this identity of who we are in Christ. So here is a diagram that kind of illustrates what we're talking about. And the reference there is 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Whoever made this chart misspelled Thessalonians, but um, just wanted to let you know I didn't do this. Uh, so I, didn't, I can't edit it. But 1 Thessalonians 5.23 describes this, that we are a tripart being, that we are body, soul, and spirit. Our body, our physical body, our flesh that can see, taste, hear, smell, we can touch. The physical body, the fleshly part of us that has certain appetites that's influenced by the world, by our own desires. And then in the middle you see there the soul that is divided up into uh, three parts, your, your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's what you think and the decisions that you make and your emotions, whether you're angry or sad or frustrated or whether you're happy or glad. Your emotions, your soul, that's part of your soulish part of you. Your will is those decisions that you make. Your mind is what you think about. But then you have the Spirit, and that's where you're born again, is in your spirit being. It's the one that has been transformed. But the Scripture says that we have to crucify the flesh, that is the body. We have to, we have to die to our flesh. Literally, we have to die to those appetites, to those desires, whether it's sexual or whether it's overeating or whatever it is, uh, profanity, you know, what, whatever it is in our bodies, the, the lust of the flesh. And we have to renew our minds through the Word of God. 
We have to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. But our spirit is born again. It's just as same as it's the same as Jesus' spirit. And uh, Andrew has had this illustrated in a cartoon form. But you can see the same thing, body, soul, and spirit. Or spirit, soul, and body. So it's the, the spirit is the brand new person. But we have, like I said, we've got to crucify our flesh. We have to renew our mind. But our spirit is transformed. We are a new creature. So, here's some questions and some scriptures to go along with it. Number one, read 1 Corinthians 6, 17, which says, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Didn't say anything about one body or one soul, but one spirit. You know, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So the question, or, or the, uh, the only way we can know that total transformation has taken place in our spirits is by the word of God. So what does this verse say has happened to us? It says we've been joined unto the Lord in our spirit. Read Ephesians 3.17. Where does Christ now dwell? All right. Ephesians 3.17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That is, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Where does Christ dwell? In our hearts. And the word hearts there is talking about our spirit. He dwells in our spirit, our spirit being. And how does this happen? Same verse. It happens by faith. It's by faith that we are saved through grace. So it's by faith that Christ dwells in our spirit. Now read 1 John 5 verse 12. Who must we possess to have salvation? Well, 1 John 5, 12 says, He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. So who, who do we have to possess to have salvation? We have to possess Jesus Christ. Next, read Col uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses <clears throat> 26 and 27. What is the mystery that was hidden from ages and generations but is now made known? So Colossians 1, 26 and 27 says, Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints or to the believers to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We don't have the hope of glory without Christ. We can't do it in ourselves, in and of ourselves. It doesn't come from us. It comes from Christ. All right, next, read Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. What was created in righteousness and true holiness? So Ephesians chapter 4 verses 23 and 24 says, And be renewed where? In the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The new man is in your spirit. Read 2 Corinthians 5.21 Whose righteousness do we possess? It is, uh, is it us? Is it our righteousness? No, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. It's not our righteousness. 
but it's Christ in us. It's his righteousness. Read Ephesians 1.4. What is the standing of believers before God? So Ephesians 1.4 says, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So what's our standing? We're holy and without blame before him in love. We're holy and without blame if Christ lives in us. Read Ephesians 1.6. How are we accepted? It, well, it says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. How were we accepted? We were accepted... Because he made us accepted in the beloved. Jesus made us accepted in the beloved. It's Christ in us that is the hope of glory. It's not what we have done, but it's what he has done. So what is our identity in Christ? He's our hope of glory. He's the one living inside of us. Now, the Bible says that we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We're to work it out. In other words, it's in our spirit. We've got to work it out into our emotions, our will, what we think about, and into our flesh and what it desires. We've got to say no to our flesh We've got to renew our minds, transform it through the, uh, through the Word of God. We've got to read and study and meditate on the Word of God. This will transform our mind. We can't think like the world. We can't think and act like the world. So we've had a transformation in our spirit. And I know when I was born again that that was true. I knew that when I gave my heart to the Lord, when I went to the altar, when I repented of my sin, when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, there was a transformation. And I knew that I was infused with the Spirit of God inside of me. I was just filled with a supernatural love and joy and peace, etc., that I didn't possess in myself, in and of myself. You know, we're selfish beings. When, when we're born into the world physically, a baby starts crying and wants attention. And it's all about me, me, me throughout our lives. But when we're born again, then our spirits are transformed and now we have to work it out into our emotions, into our will, into our thoughts, into our flesh. Again, we've got to crucify our flesh and renew our minds. But our spirit, our identity in Christ is that we are born again. We are new creations. In our spirit, we are holy and blameless. We have the same spirit as the Lord. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Do we not know that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? So again, we just have to think, well, if the Holy Spirit is living inside of me, would I be saying and doing these things? Would I be acting the way that I am? So again, we have to work it out. We have to work out that salvation into these other two realms of our total being, our body, and our soul. So I hope that this makes sense, that as far as our spirit is concerned, there's no fluctuation. We're not saved one mo moment and not saved the next. The problem is that we just got to work it out into these other two spheres of our lives. Those two areas have to be transformed and that's the process 
of working out our salvation. So I hope this, this helps, that we have to know our identity because uh, this is one thing that the enemy always tries to attack is our identity. He always wants to say, you're no good. How can God accept you? Look at what you've done. You know, always putting us down, always trashing us. But if we realize who we are in Christ, that we are holy and blameless in our spirits, and we're still struggling with these other areas of our life, and we're, you know, we've got to be mature. We've got to grow. You know, isn't that what it says in the scripture, that we're to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? We have to mature. We have to become mature. And, you know, it said about Jesus that he grew in stature and in favor with God and man. He had to mature. He came to this earth as a human being. He had to mature. And he waited till he was 30 years old before he started this ministry. He had to mature. We all have to mature. Some of us are more mature than others. So I can say that, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I may be immature. Or yes, I am a Christian, but I'm getting more mature every day. I'm becoming more and more aligned with my spirit being than I was the day before. I'm learning. I'm growing. I'm maturing. I'm aligning myself with my true self, what I am in my spirit being. So, may God bless you. Think about this, the PDF file. I'll give the link to it again in the email. And just meditate on this, study it, and think about what this is saying. But when the enemy comes in, that we can, you know, and, and he tells us, you're no good, how can God accept you? You just say, well, I am born again. I've got still got issues I've got to work out, but as far as my spirit is concerned, I'm as holy and righteous as Christ himself because he lives in me. Christ in me is the hope of glory. So God bless you.